before we get into your story, you're an entrepreneur, own several businesses, you're an author, you're a motivational speaker, you're a mentor, you do so much in your community, but it wasn't always like that. You wasn't always this positive person within your community. So why don't we go back? Take me, what was your family dynamic like? Was, was both parents in the household? What did it look like growing up as Ed Hennings? Man, that's a great question. Um, it was very uh, diverse. I had my granddad, I was raised by my grandparents. Although my mom was very active in my life, my grandmother and grandfather was the main, should I say disciplinarians, the main uh, custodians over Ed. So um, growing up like that with grandmom and granddad in the house, there was a lot of old school values that were uh, available to me. But right along with that, I had uncles and aunts that lived there as well. So I had every option on the table. I had the option of listening to granddaddy. I had an option to listen to uncle number one. I had the option to listen to aunt number three. I had an option to listen to uncle number four. So with all these options on the table, I had that grab bag of things that, that I possibly could have done or could have been. How many people lived in the house? Um, growing up, it was one, two, three, four uncles and an aunt plus me. So it was at, at one time, it was at least four, five, six people plus grandma and granddad. So at least six to eight people at all times. Got you. But you were the child. I was the, I was the baby out of my uncles and aunts with my granddad and grandma raising me. Yes. How'd you do in school? Man, I, I, I school was not hard for me. Um, school was fairly, uh, I don't want to say easy, but it wasn't as hard as a lot of people around me was um, struggling with their academics. I didn't have a problem with academics. Um, I was labeled gifted and talented um, going into the sixth grade. So I got to believe you had a lot of positive reinforcement. You got three, four uncles who live in the house, granddad, grandma, and an aunt. Mm -hmm. You're doing well in school. Did you graduate high school? Yes, I graduated high school, 1990. 1990, you graduated high school. Were you a good student the whole way through? I was a good student the whole way through. Never got in trouble. You know, I, I, had, the, I had the typical uh, urban community neighborhood altercations and stuff like that, but nothing that ever escalated to the point of um, dealing with the law or anything outside of being disciplined by my parents. So I didn't, you know, it was typical stuff, but nothing that ever escalated to me getting into, you know, the type of trouble that I eventually did. So where you, you, you sound like you got a pretty good support system. Mm -hmm. You did well in school, you graduated. Life looks good about this time. When did it take a left turn? When did you hit the streets? Or was the streets always kind of there just based on your environment that you grew up in? Yeah, I grew up in a household. Like I said, uncle number four might have been in the streets. Uncle number two might have been working at a foundry. Uncle number one might have been a mama's boy and just hung around the house. So I seen all of these different things. And uh, once I graduated from high school, I was now 18 years old, and a lot of what my granddad was teaching me uh, growing up as a youth, he had passed away my senior year of high school. So when my granddad passed, all the times that I thought about going to what was in my home and into my community that was going on, a lot of the people I grew up with was already in the streets. I just listened to my granddad and said, you know what, I'm not going to do that. But once he passed away, I didn't have that voice in my ear and I turned 18 and things that didn't matter as a youth started to matter as a young adult. So like 18 years old, you see the cars that you might didn't have that much interest in as a 15 year old, but now I'm 18 and I've been watching you guys drive cars for the last three, four, five years, my peers. And now I'm looking like, man, maybe I need one of those. <laughs> maybe I need some of that action. So once I went to school, I went to school in Phoenix, Arizona. 
of heat and ventilation and air conditioning. And that was my first slap in the face with my reality. Um, I was in school, I was getting good grades once again, but I wanted something and I wanted it now. Graduating from school was gonna take another two years, another three years, another four years. And at the age of 18, I was start looking at these things that I said like cars, material things, and I was telling myself, I want it now, I don't have any more time. I spent 18 years watching the guys run the streets and get the material items that I didn't have, but now was my time. Now was my time, so I made decisions and choices according to that mindset. Got you, so I just want to put for clarity, you graduate high school, you're living in, you grew up in rather, Milwaukee, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, you leave Milwaukee, you go to Phoenix, Arizona. You're, heat, yes, you're in heating and air conditioning school, is that correct? Yes, I'm in HVAC. Okay. Somewhere during your time in Phoenix, Arizona, like you said, things that didn't matter when you were youth start to matter now. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing the fancy cars, you're seeing people making money, and you're thinking to yourself, at best, I got two to four years before I can even afford to go out and get a job, get this degree, go out and get a job, and start earning enough money that I might be able to afford a used car. Now, nah. right. got you, understood. Exactly. While in Phoenix, Arizona, did you hook up with any street people? What? You know, you, you made it clear, I wanted to get it now. What does that mean exactly? Okay, what I found myself doing was calling back home here to Milwaukee, talking to the old fellas in the neighborhood. What's going on? What you doing? So they giving me the whole 411 on what's going on. Man, I just bought this. I just bought that. I got this kind of car, I got that. So I'm sitting out here in Phoenix, I'm already feeling like I don't belong because my family can't provide the things that even the students that was a part of my peer group, they family could afford, my family couldn't. And that pushed me even further to say, you know what, man, I don't even belong here. Who I been fooling? Trying to get good grades and go to school. I should have been in the game a long time ago. I wouldn't even be going through this. So like I said, I was calling here back to Milwaukee and asking the fellas, Man, how's looking? How, how much money you making? And it was sounding good. They was telling me, man, I made this last night. I made that last night. And I'm like, man, you know, that sounds good because I ain't got nothing. <laughs> I'm still asking moms and pops. I'm still calling home asking, could I, could I get a bike? I need a bike to ride to school, you know, and I, I just wasn't strong. So do you leave school and come back to Milwaukee? Man, I made a, I told my mom, I told my mom I wanted to take a break from school. I said, mom, I need a break. Send me a plane ticket. So my mom agreed. She said, okay, you can take a small break. You're doing good. You can come back home. You know, we're gonna send you the money for a plane ticket. How she long were you me, out there at the time? I was out there about 15 months at the time. Okay. So she sent me like 370 something dollars to get a plane ticket to fly from Phoenix back to Milwaukee. I took, I took $69.99 of that $370 odd dollars and I bought me a bus ticket. Cause back then in 1991, you could get a bus ticket for $69.99 anywhere in America. So I took that $69.99 and bought me a bus ticket and I took the other $300 and I stuck it in my pocket and I rode three days and three nights back here to Milwaukee with nothing but, I'm gonna use this $300 and I'm gonna turn it to 600, 600 to 1200 and I was off and running. Got you, so you make it back to Milwaukee, you instantly come back with a mindset, I'm hitting the streets. Yep, that was my mindset. I'm gonna make enough money to buy a car, buy some material things, all these things, and then I'm gonna go back to school. That was my initial plan. How was it for you to get in the game? Excuse me? How difficult was it for you to get in the game? Um, it wasn't difficult at all. I had family members. I had friends that I had grew up with in the neighborhood. They laughed at me like, man, you're going to try to get in this game. Here you go, you know, and all this stuff. And I gave them the money. 
And before you know it, I got tricked out of some stuff the first time, but I was determined. And, and, and it seemed like I was an overnight success, man, because I've been around this my whole life. I didn't indulge, but I've seen it up close and personal my entire life. So it wasn't that foreign to me. How much at the height of your street career were you making? And what were you selling exactly? Um, I had got to start messing with uh, cocaine. I started selling cocaine. We would uh, cook it up, bag it up in little rocks, and start selling it. And uh, I started out with maybe $150 worth. And at the height of um, my, my time doing this, um, just being honest, probably maybe a, a half a brick is what they call it. You know, so that's like 18 ounces of drugs. And, you know, selling that as weight, that would be $1,000 here in Milwaukee back in those days. So that would be the height of where I made it in the game. And it lasted me from the age of 18, and I went to prison at 24. So you selling for six years? Yes. So six years off and on. I tried numerous times to walk away from this type of lifestyle. But by then, uh, people don't understand that the addiction of selling is just as strong as the addiction of using. So my addiction was not actually to the drugs, but to the independence that selling drugs gave me. Because even to this day, I know how independent I am and driven to be independent. Drugs gave me an independence where I didn't have to ask mom, dad, anybody for anything. And that was a high for me. Like, I am free. I don't have to ask anybody for anything. And there was no greater feeling for me. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.